good evening and welcome to the New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, special 2020 to 2021 of the Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. My website is www.mossuponstones.com and there's also a Wix site called Thomas Sheridan Arts and you'll find links to everything else. And it's a vast archive at this point, all from those two sites. I hope you had an enjoyable Christmas. And firstly, I'd like to say thank you for the people who listened to the Christmas show. Within two days or so, we had nearly 10,000 views. This is the biggest I've ever had as my audience. is now the biggest I've ever had as an audience in all the 10 years. Although I'm still within relative obscurity. Uh, it's still nice to know that not only is it uh, been a slow incremental growth in audience over the years, but how many have been uh, of you that have been around for just the last decade are still here. I love that even more, the fact that I've been able to hold on to a sizable chunk of the audience from the old days. Not only makes me feel good that I'm still producing content that people want to hear, see, and talk about, but also... The fact that this conversation has continued to grow and evolve over the years in whatever direction my work took and people were willing to go along with it. And that's uh, that's an amazing thing because that's quite rare in alternative media where individuals tend to stick to one or two core subjects and then hold on to that demographic and that angle for as long as they can or as long as there's interest in them where someone who has more of a shotgun approach like me it's very difficult to capture the consciousness of the listener because i'm not fixed into one particular topic there's more of a polymathic kind of approach here what's great is that people are okay with that and it allows people to open up their minds. So someone who may have got into me through my books on psychopathy 10 years ago or develop an interest in things like magic, cryptids, paranormal 40, and serial killers, stuff that they wouldn't have been interested in before or even had their mind open to certain movies and books they would have never read directly as a result of me fluctuating between these topics that fascinate me and interest me. And so there's something for everybody, I hope. I mean, it's a, a licorice all sorts of content over the last 10 years. And the feedback to the Christmas show certainly proves that people do enjoy this as much as I enjoy talking about it. Like I always said, if I didn't really have a large audience of any kind, I'd still probably be doing these videos just like I was 11, 12 years ago to just have a conversation put out there in the hope that even one or two people see it, one or two people can talk about it. And that's why it's important for people that have podcasts and radio shows that don't get huge numbers, just to keep plugging at it as long as you enjoy it, because there's a great therapeutic, cathartic element in producing these dialogues and putting them out there. That is hard to describe unless you've actually done that. You meet the most wonderful people and you you find new information and discoveries that are really important. And you grow in terms of your conscious engagement with the rest of reality. And this is a, this is the ultimately the tool kit, the arsenal from which you develop your own consciousness firewall to get around, overcome, and dodge these slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and this increasingly bizarre reality that's falling asunder that we're all currently leaving. Yes, I now believe this more than ever. All I have to do is look at the response to my own shows, particularly the Christmas one. It, the comments section is filled with people who've had enough of the, uh, the psychotic psychosphere of the technocratic utopian horror vision that's been foisted upon us. I was just talking to a friend there the other day about how young teenage girls are indistinguishable now at this point from sex robots. 
And this is really what's happening there replacing real women with sex robots and this is why things like instagram filters these dissociative accumulators where people who use them all the time don't actually know what they look like themselves anymore and can't distinguish between the instagram filter or the snapchat filter and their own physical state i've written about this years and years ago and what happens is they're looking more and more and you see this in the pop stars as well like what the sex robots look like and this is because there's an agenda here by these technocratic utopian psychotics to actually replace wheel women with sex robots this is part of the transhumanist posthumanist carryover they don't want any form of culture that's existed up until this point to remain this is a cultural reset as much as a technocratic one but it's fundamentally what they're looking for is a psychological psychic reset because they don't understand what human beings are so they constantly have to do correct us make perfect that which they deem imperfect and to them see the i always think that movie the revenge of the nerds in the movie the revenge of the nerds lewis and the nerds are actually the evil ones we know they're the evil ones because look at the world that they've created this technocratic fascist utopian psychosphere is directly a result of the ones who were in college at the time the revenge of the nerds movie was made and looking back on it now there was almost a something of an evolutionary imperative by the jocks quote unquote to bring the nerds down and stop them from forming their own fraternity or coming into the jocks fraternity because what happens when weak men take over a society is that the most appalling miscarriages of 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 justice take place upon humanity remember although we think in terms of things such as the bolsheviks and the other fascist movements and other totalitarian regimes like pol pot's year zero and the khmer rouge and chinese cultural revolution these things are built upon the spineless cowards of weak men these queef golems who in their internal terror become the mortar which cements tyranny together if you look at the atrocities committed by the nkvd the precursor to the kgb within the soviet union the bolsheviks and their murder squads inside the killing rooms they were the local the local nerds the local social failure the local loser a weak frightened little man given a revolver will kill easily kill a girl that he had a crush on who lived on this next door street if he's told to do so in order to survive and this is what they're like and we're seeing this all the time now with the the queef golems on their mask when you hear someone online screaming you can't end the lockdown because you'll kill my elderly mother they're not doing it because they care about their elderly mother in terms of her health and welfare you will find that these will be upper middle age loser males who still live with their parents and their mother and their father are still their enablers and therefore they're terrified of the coronavirus killing their mother because he'll have no one to wash his socks he won't have his 80 year old mother to wash his socks and cook his dinner for him anymore and he'll have to fend for himself and that's the real reason why these uh these this certain type of queef golem in the mid to late 50s are the ones most vocal about you know social distancing wearing the mask constant lockdowns is because they're genuinely terrified that the c19 virus will kill their elderly mother and therefore there'll be no one to make the tea for them and we remember that that's the weak spineless ineffectual queef golem who has achieved nothing in his life without the help of enablers will do anything to hold on to those enablers to stop them from 
vanishing into the miasma of obscurity. And you see that even things like I spoke right about six months before uh, the the, uh, the 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 whole Rona thing started. I made a video on the Committee of Public Safety, which functioned during the French Revolution, and it was the same thing again. If you look at the individuals who committed the atrocities during the French Revolution, and remember, it wasn't all just killing aristocrats at the guillotine. Huge numbers of Catholics and other individuals were just simply rounded up and slaughtered. It was the scum of the air to French society who took to, took care to did this. The Freemasons and the likes of Robespierre and the Committee on Public Safety gave little badges to the jobswarts around Paris and other cities and told them to round up enemies of the revolution. And they're exactly the same demographic again. They were the, they were the queef golems of revolutionary France. Now, these are people who are nothing. They're absolutely nothing. But if you give them a piece of power, especially if that power allows them to deny their darkest internal terrors of their weak, coward estate, they are, they are capable of the most atrocious and appalling atrocities. And look around you. Look around you at the ones today. But having said that, this is one of the reasons I decided to make this New Year's Eve special. I was just going to do the Christmas one and leave it at that. But the reason why I went to do this this one now is because, like I was saying, there is something about that period between New Year's Eve and now right in the middle of where I am now, a few days before, sorry, Christmas Eve, a few days before New Year's Eve, where we fall into a kind of a, a ethereal reality tunnel that's narrowed down in a, such a manner by extension of the shorter days post solstice, the colder weather, the, the tendency towards seclusion or the need to seclusion following what should have been, you know, get togethers at Christmas in tandem with this kind of like hauntology atmosphere. If you if you go look at Greg Moffat's Legalized Freedom podcasts, he and I did some great shows on the concept of hauntology. And this is the hauntology period. This is why you had the great Christmas stories of, you know, ghost stories like the, the Signal Man produced in the 70s with Den Bellum Elliott when the BBC was good the Charles Dickens ghost story. You have this kind of Christmas ghost story as aspect. That's because you're pulled into a place that's very introspective and existential. And in within the, within inside this hauntological consciousness that you develop at this time of year, it, it becomes the birthplace place of new ways of thinking in terms of looking at things. This is why me melancholy and a sense of loss, even if you're not, you haven't really lost anyone, is very powerful this time of year. You have a strong longing for the loss of something that didn't exist, or if it did exist, you can't quite put your finger on it. Couple this with the 2020 bizarreness of this scandemic and people being made prisoners in their own homes, and uh, the, the light of the world being taken from people under the auspices of public safety again. And you're going to have even deeper, deeper falling into oneself and the nature of consciousness and the nature of society and all that it represents. And within that, there's a powerful kind of beauty. There is the, the haunting beauty of the novels of Isaac Bishevitz Singer, James Joyce, Charles Dickens, the poetry of so many, almost gothic sense of ethereal shadow dancing across the landscape, both external and internal. 
and this became very apparent after I did the Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, sorry, new VON special. It transformed something inside me, and I'm sure others did too. The reaction to the show was very powerful. There was a very almost a sense of solemn introspection within the comments section of the video, which makes me very proud as it just shows that I have a remarkable audience of very deep thinking, mature and intelligent people who don't fly from, you know, one one hyped up conspiracy bullshit to the next. And that, that's a really good thing. It shows that there's if there's been one legacy to my work over the years, it has been a grounding of people who would be inclined to go towards the conspiratorial ends of things, and quite rightly too. There's there's absolutely nothing wrong with you know a sense of cynicism at all, and questioning the nature of authoritarian structures. It's one of the most healthiest things that a human being within a developed society can do. But like anything else in life, you can fall in love or you can fall madly in love. And it's always best to not fall madly in love and just remain with the love you can find. And the same thing happens with um, these falling into these conspiracy theories. That, you know, it's best to stick with the ones that have meat on the bones rather than looking for a new carcass everywhere someone points one out. And I think that's been a good legacy of the VON programs and my podcasts and shows over the years is that it has allowed people who might have even been wary of going into the world of conspiracy to allow them to walk in there without being thrown into it head first and it becoming a traumatic experience of noise and confusion and false hopes of some kind of Christian redemption that one day the elites are all going to be arrested or something like that. It's much more of a mature reflection in terms of this is what it is, this is where it goes, how do I and the ones I love personally escape this or deal with it or live around it. And there's great, there's great freedom in that. I look at someone like John Waters and I was watching this interview with Dave Cullen, the Christmas special, which is on BitChute. You have to see it if you haven't seen it. It's amazing. And they mentioned me a few times, which is very kind of them. But I was just thinking, I was just looking at the video of John Waters talking to Dave. And John Waters, I can't, you know, if you don't live in Ireland, you have no idea what a big, a famous person he was. He was a very, very famous mainstream journalist here. Not only working for the Irish Times, and I think he worked for the Independent as well. But he was always on television, on radio, constantly. All, constantly on TV. Uh, non-stop and uh, the irony of that is that now he's fallen afoul of the Irish mainstream and uh, he's been rejected by them for uh, being honest I told this to him when I met him I said you know when I realized you were you woke up or you were changing was when there was some kind of special about the changes in Irish society on RTA the, the big TV network here and I heard you mention something about the Frankfurt School. And I just laughed. And I said, like, and I even remember, I, had, I saw them to him when I met him. I said, like, the, the, when you mentioned the Frankfurt School, I'd never heard anyone on mainstream Irish TV bring that up before. Now, as a result, that was the beginning of the end of his career with the Irish mainstream. But he's better off without it. At the same time, too, the irony of that now is because of his step into alternative journalism uh, one well, of the journalism writing and talking and broadcasting what he does now with people like dave cullen is that he now has he's now more famous than he ever was this is the irony of ireland and the little fish big fish little pond thing you know that the the, the so-called stars of irish tv are still nobodies we're in a small country in the scheme of greater bigger things by rejecting that or being made an outcast by that, John Waters is now very famous all over the world because of alt media. People in other countries that would have never heard of him if he had a play or never reached his work or got to understand his amazing insights and his sublime use of metaphor would have never found any of this out or discovered anything about him 
had he remained the big fish in the little pond that is Irish mainstream media. It was a classic, uh, you know, it's a classic moment, a kind of a, a Joseph Campbell-esque mythological moment of destroying yourself in order to grow yourself. It's that kind of element, uh, killing the one as killing the killing the inauthentic aspect of your self. And I'm not judging anybody or putting claiming to know. I'm not psychoanalyzing the man, but I'm just saying it's ironic now that he's because of his his obliteration of his mainstream status in Ireland that he's now an international voice for a much larger and a much more dedicated and objectively listening audience and that's 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 the freedom that comes with breaking away from the limitations that sometimes we impose upon ourselves in order to feel comfort there's nothing in a comfort zone except of the the miasma of mediocrity which eventually leads into the the world of misery there's really nothing in it and when you see these people screaming oh well, you can't end the lockdown cuz you have to protect my mother you have to protect my granny my elderly mother who's making his dinner every day cuz he can't do it himself that is the miasma of mediocrity trying to impose itself upon everyone else that's the queef golem or reject i'm seeing this thing it's kind of funny because it's so obviously being done for controversy but there's a a production being made i'm not sure if it's a tv show or a a movie either way i won't watch it because i don't want to be arsed of the uh, anne boleyn henry the eighth's second wife and anne boleyn was of course a horrible sad story executed because she couldn't produce a son for this psychopath called Henry VIII, this Tudor. And uh, she was a remarkable woman when you start reading about her. She definitely had this kind of almost like witchcraft about her. And uh, he was obviously enchanted with her until he realized that she had a, basically a power that he didn't. And he had her head chopped off. It's an awful story. But anyway, they have a black lady now playing the part of Anne Boleyn. And it's causing a lot of controversy, which is the reason why she was hired for it. That's all. That's the only reason she was hired. Now, before, first let me say, there's absolutely nothing wrong with anyone of any race playing a fictional character within a story. No, it's It's fine. That's why it's called acting. You know, there's no problem with that at all. I mean, it, it works quite well when it's done sometimes too. Like in the Robin Hood movie with Kevin Costner, which is, you know, it's a Hollywood fluff, but I found I find it a very enjoyable film in its own kind of fun fantasy way. But you have Morgan Freeman is cast very well as a Moorish, a Moorish soldier who's come back to England with Robin Hood from the wars, of the Crusades, and although he's african-american and you you know his answer he doesn't look really look moorish or anything like that it the character works great you know there's no problem with that because he's a fictional character there's no problem with a fictional character being played by anyone of any race but when you have a historical drama and you deliberately cast someone who's of a very different race within that or ethnic group it doesn't work for lots of reasons because it's historically dishonest it's dishonest, and it's it's just as, it's just as historically dishonest to cast a black lady. I'm sure she's a very nice woman and a competent actress. Good luck to her. I hope she's very successful, and you can't blame her for taking a, a lucrative job like that. But it's as dishonest as casting a black lady to play Anne Boleyn as it would be to have a white guy playing Nelson Mandela. It's just it's just silly it's it's just silly and wrong and there's lots of other elements of this too as well i'd like to talk about now the kind of people who would find this challenging to convention and you know remarkable 
are typical of these liberals who are utterly intoxicated by skin colour. A, a, li- a lefty and a liberal only care, it, you'll never meet anyone so utterly intoxicated by race and skin colour as a so-called liberal or left, left-wing left type. They are, they are obsessed with only two things, genitalia and skin colour. And this is the only thing that interests them. And therefore, they deliberately want to antagonize and cause racial tensions between black and white folks who otherwise would have no problems with one another by doing things like casting a black lady in the role of Anne Boleyn. It's, del- it's done deliberately for tacky contra- con- controversy by the, pro- the production team or the casting manager, or whatever the fuck he's called, and uh, to do that for that reason. Now, and it's because it's a historic drama, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. And uh, it, because it's dishonest to history. Now, if, she, if Anne Boleyn was a fictional character like, you know, Kathy and Wuthering Heights, and she was played by a black lady or a Chinese lady or a Latino lady, that'd be fine because Kathy didn't exist. You know, so it's that that's the difference. Once it becomes a start, you have to be honest to the historic story as best you can and this has been this is something that that's just it's 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 going to cause lots of problems for lots of reasons but one of the main reasons i find this incredibly racist against see that the, the guy who cast the guy who's cast that a black lady to play Anne Boleyn is actually quite racist and i'll tell you why what happens is when you get black people to play white characters what you're doing is you're giving the white establishment who runs Hollywood, the BBC, and so on, a license to not portray the fascinating history of black people instead. So, for instance, she should really be in a historic drama about some African queen or some great woman in the, in the West Indies someone like that, an African-American lady, and to promote that culture. Now, the fact that I can't think of an amazing woman, black woman from the West Indies, is the beautifully points out the point that I'm making. It's because popular culture, these same ones who talk about diversity and inclusion, don't give a damn about people of color's actual real history. They don't give a damn. So what they do is they get these people in the name of inclusion, which is their own sort of like fluffing themselves, you know, their own self-fluffers, put these people of color in roles that were portraying historic white figures in order to pretend they're helping. In reality, they're not. They're destroying because they're moving, they're moving the consciousness further away from the historic portrayal of you know black history real black history so that's the first aspect of it okay that that these people are claiming to be inclusive and diverse are actually being quite racist against black people because they couldn't be arsed or bothered making a movie about black history and i'm not talking about cliche things like slavery and stuff like that you look you i've started to look at sub-saharan african ancient megaliths And there is remarkable, there were incredible kingdoms and empires which existed in places like Ghana. Hundreds, thousands of years ago. Where where are their portrayals on in Hollywood or the BBC? Where where we where the stories on the screen about them? They're nowhere. The Nilotech people of Western Africa of Eastern Africa, Sub Saharan Africa fascinating culture where are they they're nowhere nowhere the same ones who scream about inclusivity inclusivity and diversity and cast a black lady in the role of Anne Boleyn couldn't be arsed making a film about the great empires of sub-saharan Africa that built amazing structures that are still present today the Dogons of Mali Oh no, no, no. Let's let's prove let, 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 they we don't care about them because 
you know, I'm too busy being, you know, Fontaine, you know, Fontaine, uh, Excelsior Macmillan of the, the BBC's casting department and diversity department. Let's, let's, let's have a Chinese disabled person play Doctor Who. This is how they think. This is how distorted and twisted they are. They don't like anyone except their own narcissism. There's also another, shall we say, thing I would like to throw into the mix. Another another vegetable into the stew of all this controversy about this, this black actress playing Anne Bonin. Could there be a form of continuing to punish Anne Bonin? Now, for instance, when in Anne Boleyn is generally blamed, was generally blamed by Catholics for the loss of England from the Catholic religion. And she was basically seen as the cause of the Reformation. Which is completely unfair because that's not true at all. But she was, she was, she was, she was, she was sort of like blamed by the papacy in some ways. So this is why she was considered a witch. Now you have these Christians who were, who were glad to see her dead, these Catholics who were glad to see her dead and have no sympathy for her suffering. And also the royals who didn't like her either because basically she obviously had some kind of charismatic power that the, the royalty is not comfortable with. Could this thing be a kind of a burlesquing? 500 years later or so, a, bu a continual burlesquing of Anne Boleyn. That 500 years after her death, they won't even allow a person of the same race as her to play her in a film. So this is a way of kind of burlesquing her, continuing to mock and curse her on behalf of the royals. I know it's a stretch to probably say this, but I wouldn't put anything past any of these people. This is how they are. After all, we're talking about the people who put Rolf Harris in prison on basically bogus charges that, would have, that weren't even enough to bring him down to the police station. Rolf Harris went to prison for allegedly touching a woman's bottom 40 years ago in Butlins. All the other stuff you heard on the media about him being a nonce and everything, all those charges were dropped. All of them. That was an off-with-his-head moment because... There was an infamous BBC show where he painted the Queen's portrait and he was clearly terrified and nervous of her because he was unable to have a conversation with a non-human. The show and the painting he made of Queen Elizabeth II prove conclusively that she is not human, whatever she is. And therefore, he made the mistake, or should I say, was unfortunately the one involved in all that that had to be made an example of and he was given the off of the head treatment sent to the tower he was also used to placate the public anger over jimmy savile getting away with it and jimmy savile's connection with the royals rolf harris was a very easy target to do this to instead and to this day, especially the morons in, in the truther scene, if the real truthers would actually have examined this, the Rolf Harris, there's still no proof that he did anything worthy of even dragging him into a police station. A woman who claimed that she he touched her arse 40 years ago, out of the blue, after 40 years of keeping quiet, was the reason why he went to jail. Officially. Unofficially, it's because he painted the queen as the monster that it is. And these same people, these same creatures in that bloodline, whatever they are, are probably delighted with this burlesquing of Anne Boleyn 500 years after the fact. But not only did they rob her of her head, rob her of her historical legacy, get her husband to pass the blame of the Reformation and the religious wars onto her, but now the final mockery is that she's not even allowed to look like what she actually looked like. You hear people talking a lot, 
staying with the subject of movies, you know, whistleblowing, you know, these movies, they, they blow the whistle on certain individuals, on the Illuminati, and this kind of thing, you know, and there's been some very strange connections made between films that don't do that, and apparently do, one of them is that the the movie The Shining, this is one of the most ridiculous conspiracy theories I think I've ever heard, that The Shining is a, about the fake moon landings, and because the little boy is wearing a, a jumper with Apollo 11, and he walks up to a room that's the same number as the, to the Earth's distance from the moon, this means that the little boy was symbolic of Stanley Kubrick, faking the moon landings for nasa it's just you know just ridiculous stuff i mean there's so many things you could extrapolate from the shining but that is just it just it's just bonkers bonkers and it was just you know people go oh that's blowing the whistle that's that's you know illuminati you're blowing the whistle on the moon landing or fake you know and it's, it's not true at all it's it's just there's nothing in any of those 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 the shining film to suggest it's about that. You know? And uh you could twist it anyway. I mean the shining is one of the best movies ever made. Even though it's completely different than the book. But it's uh it's still fantastic. But it's really uh, you know, you want to talk about that the madness of social isolation and the of uh, the uh, the effect of karma. I thought Jack Nicholson portrayal as Torrance was absolutely fantastic in that film. And uh, the sense of isolation in the building that fills it with ghosts and memories instead of creativity. Because he ultimately, he, was, he wanted to be a writer. He didn't have the talent to be a writer. So that he was have to confront the, uh, the emptiness that was himself inside this building and you know there's so many psychological and other motifs and just the enjoyment of the movie for what the movie is to actually go and say oh it's really a code about the fake moon landings it's about as silly as you can get especially as the, the evidence is then produced is about as wildly speculating as you could possibly come up with and another one of these films that's supposed to be blowing the whistle is eyes wide shut blown on the illuminati they're having a secret illuminati satanic a beautiful foil, the you know ritual in the big house, you know. Well, all that film really shows is that rich people are involved in crazy stuff, and these kind of you know we've always known about these orgies that they have. That's why the speaking of the British royals again, Prince Philip and the Profumo affair. This the this the files on that are sealed until fifty years after Prince Philip is dead. Because they were just these kind of like sex parties of the rich and the bored that you see in that portrayed in that film, these masquerade balls. And it's a way for respectable people, quote unquote, to in indulge themselves in filth in a kind of dissociative manner where it's not really them who are, you know, taking cocaine, shooting up heroin and having sex with prostitutes because they're wearing a mask. You know, that's, that's what that film is about. It's nothing to do with the Illuminati whistleblowing and all this nonsense. However, there is one film that Hollywood made that is definitely about whistleblowing, and it is Godfather 3. Now, I'm a huge fan of the Godfather movie series, including the third one, you might be, you might be surprised to learn, because it was universally trashed. Well, let's put this into perspective, right? The first two Godfather movies, Godfather and Godfather 2, are two of the greatest movies ever made. They're perfect. They're absolutely perfect. They're masterpieces. They're Rembrandt paintings and Shakespeare plays fused together and brought to life by the genius of Francis Ford Coppola. And you cannot expect him to have made a third perfect film the first two are just put it this way no band made three rarely made three perfect albums in a row 
So he was it's rare that especially twenty years after the second one, or whatever it was, eighteen years that they made Godfather three. The everything had changed. The 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 actor that Al Pacino was in Godfather one and two playing Michael Corleone it was not the same Al Pacino actor that a, that shows up in Godfather three. So the the energy, the the, the the sort of like the 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 charismatic energy of Al Pacino was quite different as a middle aged man than when he was a young guy. When he's in when he plays Michael Corleone in the two first two films, he has that intense you know, Italian but also Shakespearean aspect to his personality. Uh, very rich and deep and you know, he was, you know, he, it just was, it pours out of him and it just is a remarkable performance in both of those movies. In the third film, he is not the same Al Pacino. He's the Al Pacino of movies like Scent of a Woman or, uh, what was the one? The Devil's Advocate with Keanu Reeves. Still fantastic. Still a fantastic actor. But not the same Al Pacino who was in the first two films. So to expect him to to be the same Michael Corleone in Godfather 3 that he was in Godfather 1 and 2 was an enormous ask. It was a big ask, okay? So that was never going to happen. Plus Robert Duvall as Thomas wasn't in the third film. And a lot of the kind of associated characters that made the first two films amazing like the character who played the actor who played mo green in the first film he is very short it's really based on bugsy malone the real life jewish gangster that invented hollywood or sorry las vegas it's just amazing he didn't have that in the third one that kind of like you know selection box of amazing ancillary characters around uh, the, the main character of of Michael Corleone, Anthony Garcia played his nephew, Sonny's son, Sonny's bastard son, uh, Vincent. And he was good, and he's a good actor, but he still wasn't convincing. And and Joe Montagna played the other the the, the other character, gangster. It just wasn't the same. So, and also the world had changed greatly since the seventies, and especially Hollywood. Hollywood's golden age of movies was the 1970s. That's when all our best, the best, Hollywood came of age in the 70s. By the time 1990 or 91 came around, whenever Godfather 3 was made, Hollywood was very different. Very, very different. Also, the way it's filmed and the lighting did not have the same ambiance and mood and cinematography. No, depth and gravitas that the first two movies had but having said all that you take godfather 3 as a standalone movie just forget that that say it was a different character not michael corleone say it was somebody else al pacino was playing you take godfather 3 as a standalone film separating it from the first two films it's still a bloody good movie and it's a very very interesting movie for lots of reasons one of the reasons is it borrows heavily from David Yallop's book in God's name or is in that world about the assassination of the Vatican banker Roberto Calvi by the P2 Propaganda Due Italian Catholic Freemasonic Lodge when he was found hanged off Blackfriars Bridge, symbolic Blackfriars Bridge in London, after he'd been bashing on the door of the Freemasonic Lodge, Grand Lodge of, of England in London, trying to get refuge and safety. Now, what Francis Ford Coppola did with Godfather 3 was to dovetail that aspect or that conspiratorial element into the Godfather 3 movie. He was he was whistled he was deliberately whistleblowing. He was. Very, very overt. There was no reason for that to be dovetailed in there. 
even with the whole story of the Corleone family trying to take over this fictional company called the Mobilari, which was the main shareholder was the, Vat- the Bank of Vatican City, that would have been enough to tell a story. The only reason Francis Ford Coppola dovetailed the conspiratorial stuff, which is very real. I always say to people, you've heard me on this show for years, if you have a friend who thinks there's no such thing as conspiracies, sit them down and force them to read In God's Name by David Yallop. And it's it's all there. It's, it's bulletproof. Now, when the movie Godfather 3 came out, it was the first time I'd ever heard anyone use the term conspiracy theory to attack a work of art or you know a creative element, a creative product by somebody in that kind of manner in which we've come to know it today. Prior to that, conspiracy theory was tolerated or it was seen as just a kind of an, in, another aspect of life. You know, it was, it was you know, the, the Fox Mulder, the X-Files. It was just... It was just something that was out there, but it wasn't seen as a sinister force that was a danger to reality. The first time I'd ever heard the term conspiracy theory used in such a manner as to portray what was being presented as some kind of danger to the human race was when the reviews of Godfather 3 first came out. And they were, un- they were almost universally the same. The film was trashed. Trashed. Now, two things they trashed it on. Sophia Coppola, uh, Coppola's played Mary, Michael Corleone's daughter, in it. And her performance was supposed to be atrocious. It wasn't. You watch that now, it's not. It's for someone who was 19-year-old in their first major film. It was, it was, it was adequate. It wasn't an award-winning performance. But it certainly wasn't wooden and stiff. In fact, Diane Keaton was probably the one person who was cast within those three Godfather films who who was not a particularly good actress. And yet she's supposed to be some kind of legend uh, and with a hell of a lot of experience as well. And yet she gets off scot-free where because accusations of nepotism, Sofia Coppola is, is, is trashed. And so that was the first and it was unfair because she wasn't a major part of that story. She was, again, an ancillary character. The other thing they trashed it on was what I just said. It was a film of outlandish conspiracy theories, even though fundamentally what Francis Ford Coppola was whistleblowing in Godfather 3 was, was all proven to be correct, not only in David Yallop's book In God's Name, but also in the ensuing court cases that ha- took place within the Italian courts and were, you know, found guilty by the highest levels of Italian judiciary. You had members of Propaganda Due, P2, in cages inside Italian courts in Verona being charged with conspiracy to feed bombs, bomb material, to the Brigade Rossi or some other left-wing terrorist group who blew up train stations, killing large numbers of people in Italy. All this going directly back to the Vatican. Now, the Vatican's banker, as I said, Roberto Calvi, being found swung, swinging off a bridge with a rope around his neck. He was the Vatican banker. All your screaming of conspiracy theories is irrelevant, because that's, that's the truth, that's what happened. You don't commit suicide by throwing yourself off Blackfriars Bridge. That was a symbolic murder. Especially as he'd been knocking on the door looking for ref, saying people were coming to kill him. These would be the Swiss guards who killed him, by the way. Now, within Godfather 3, there's a scene that's in there which is quite staggering when you see it now. Michael Corleone, played by Al Pacino, says a line of Our greatest enemies are unknown to us. We just don't know who the real ones are. And he's talking about how the new Pope, Pope John Paul I, is in extreme danger because he wants to open the books on the Vatican City Bank to see just what, this has actually happened in real life, 
just what kind of funny, dodgy business dealings the Vatican and the papacy is involved in. Now, according to David Yallop, indirectly, and Francis Ford Coppola in Godfather 3, directly, Pope John Paul I was murdered because of this. After 33 days, this was a message sent out by Freemasons to the world that even a Pope isn't safe if he gets in the hands of the wrong people. While Al Pacino is mentioning we don't know who the big, the real enemies are, he asks who, he asks who, he asks Andy Garcia playing Vincent, Vincent Corleone, who, who was behind it? And he goes, Propaganda due. I don't know. The secret unknowns. He didn't use the term the Illuminati. He used a very interesting term, which I actually quite like. And I, I'd be more inclined to people use this from now on than nonsense like the Illuminati, which hasn't existed for, what, 200 years now. Secret unknowns. That's a very, very good way of identifying the hidden power behind even the technocratic utopian psychotics involved in the Great Reset. Remember, Klaus Schwab is a known. There's still people behind him pulling strings, the secret unknowns. And I absolutely love that when, uh, you know, when and, uh, uh, Andy Garcia said that. The secret unknowns. Now, that was about as much whistleblowing as you'll ever get in a film. And then it has, the, you know, one of the, the, the best, you know, some of the best scenes following this. The, you know, the, the assassination scenes that are typical of Godfather films. One of them including a fantastic shot of a, a dodgy Irish cardinal being thrown off the, the dome of St. Peter's Square and into the floor of the Vatican. I mean, that was just, that was just an awesome scene. But go back and watch Godfather. In fact, go back and watch all the Godfather films. But go back and watch Godfather 3 if you've, if you've seen the first two. And especially if you've been told that it's shite and a horrible film. Watch it as a standalone film. Watch the Godfather 3 as a standalone film, right? Away from the other two, in that consciousness that I'm not watching a continuum of the first two movies. I'm watching a new film with new eyes. And um, it's not the Michael Corleone of the first two films. It's a, it's a character I've never heard from. And that film is filled with revelations and whistleblowing like no other Hollywood film. Now, continuing on with the Vatican theme. I don't know why I've been thinking about this a lot lately, but I have. I've been fascinated by the papal scene. You know, I've even been going to the the Vatican website and and just reading up on their press releases and so on. The Vatican is going through the most colossal change since the Reformation. And the funny thing is, we're not hearing anything about it. We're not hearing anything about it. In fact, I would go as far to, as far as to say that under Pope Francis, we are going, we're experiencing Vatican III. Now, what Vatican? If you don't know what Vatican, what I mean by Vatican III, in the late nineteen sixties, Pope Paul the Sixth, I think it was, had the Vatican II, and the Vatican II was a sweeping reformation. We were told of the Catholic Church, the most well-known aspect of this was the removal of the latin mass and the replacement with mass said in the language of the host nation so whatever country you lived in many catholics and there are movements like the Tridenti tridentine catholics who believe that this was a fatal mistake for the papacy and the catholic church that the magic of the cat of the latin mask mass which goes right back to the pagan masses held at the temple of jupiter by the pagan priests three thousand years ago spoken in latin carried all the way through christianized and carried all the way through into the papacy into the modern catholic mass until late 1960s 
was a continuum of an ancient magical tradition. And people would talk about, I don't remember the cap de la masses. I was too young. They were, you know, I was only a baby when they were, they were abolished. But people tell me, have told me over the years, is that when you went to the Latin mass, you really felt like you were transported into another reality. It was beautiful. The Latin, even though you didn't understand what the priest was saying, often, you know, you did your catechism, you, you did learn, but generally they didn't. They said that it didn't matter. There was a what the Lutherans called the hocus pocus of the Latin Mass. That's where the term hocus pocus comes from. That it was it was a sense of magic and sorcery and you know mysticism that was completely lost when the Latin Mass was abolished. And that was the main thing of Vatican II. Vatican II was also people believed the Pope was going to legalize the use of artificial contraception such as condoms and there was it was that that was that debate was actually on the table and uh, of course it was struck off in the end but at least vatican ii and all the things that happened with it was out in the open it you know they had the, the vatican being very good at mass media and press invited the world's media to take part and report this back and all the top newspapers and TV and radio stations in the world at the time of Vatican II reported daily updates all over the world to Catholics to keep them informed of what was being debated by the cardinals, and what was being approved and ratified by the papacy, and so on. You, you, the, the, it didn't matter if you were a, a wealthy Italian Catholic living in Turin or a poor Catholic living in Mexico, rural Mexico, you got the same information from the Vatican. They made sure that everyone knew what was happening and going on. Now, the same thing is happening today, but it's even more sweeping. We're, in, we're basically in the midst of Vatican III, and yet Catholics are not being informed about what has really got all these, these, these intense changes that are happening within, within Catholicism. And within Catholic life. And these are the most sweeping reforms ever, probably since the foundation of the Vatican, 1700 years ago, or whatever it was. Now, this is all very suspicious to me, and I'll tell you why. The Pope before, now remember, Pope Francis is the first ever Jesuit to ever hold the position. Before him, the last Pope that wasn't was the German Pope, Pope Benedict. Now, Pope Benedict got a lot of slagging. He didn't look very well in photographs. He, there was, you know, you see photographs on where he looked evil or something, but you can do that with anyone. We don't really know what kind of man he is. And Pope Benedict was the first Pope probably ever to be fired. He was fired, right? And people claimed, well, he was fired because he, he was in poor health or he mis well, he's still alive. He mismanaged the uh, the running of the Vatican. Blah 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 blah. He didn't look very, you know, he didn't look very appealing, you know, blah this kind of thing, etc. I'll tell you why he was fired. He was fired because one day during a peace ceremony about seven years, eight years ago, he released a couple of white doves, and they were immediately torn to pieces above Saint Peter's Square by hooded crows <clears throat> in fact the same hooded crows is the morrigan or the morrigan and seagulls as well so seagulls and hooded crows in the vatican attacked two white doves and slaughtered them above saint peter's square now uh, this would have been seen as a horrific augury within the vatican itself in fact people like me who saw it at the time immediately knew right away that my pagan radar went off the scale in terms of screaming. Observe, observe, react, react, understand, understand. To see those photographs is still quite in intense after all these years. Uh, I did some. I did a blog post about it, which I'll post down below this video. And it was the end of him because he was seen by the Vatican as the cursed Pope after that point. 
and eventually he was fired, a pope, and a pope actually fired. That's basically what happened to Pope Benedict, because he was a cursed pope. Next thing you know, you have this Pope Benedict, sorry, Pope Francis, Argentinian guy, uh, with, with coming in with some very dodgy political con- connections in South America, Argentina, coming in and basically being the Juan Peron of the papacy, of the Holy See. He's not so much the Holy Father, but he's like the the general secretary of the Catholic Communist Party. One of the things I'll always remember about the papacy, and always was very powerful, was the very strong image, was the power of cardinals. Cardinals were incredibly powerful in within, and a strong archetypal force within the papacy, as the cardinal. And cardinals all over the world held tremendous political power. For instance, the you know like the in New York City cardinal, uh, the archbishop, the archbishop was a massive, but the cardinals in North America were enormously powerful. This is why U.S. presidents had to play games with them and still do have to play play around pussyfoot around them. Well, they not anymore. They don't. Have you noticed how cardinals have kind of vanished from? prominence within the papal seat you never hear about cardinals anymore you never hear about conflicts in canon law and i and i look and i watch and i read the vatican website which is actually very interesting translated into numerous languages and i you don't hear much about this all you hear is pope francis said this pope francis wants that he's running the papacy like a true dictator completely and he's in a very jesuitical style in that he's not telling anybody you just wake up in the morning and you find that the version of catholicism that existed today is different than the one that existed yesterday so this guy has been brought in by the jesuits to take over the holy see not as the holy father but as the General Secretary of the Catholic Communist Party. This is why he is signed up to everything, like the Great Resets, the Technocratic Future, the whole shebang, kit and caboodle. This is why he pawns and he pushes it. This is also why he's practically Muslim. He spends more time praising Islam than he does praising his own religion. That's because, like the reunification with the Eastern Orthodox Church, he is a member. Of, he is a member of a, an element within the Holy See that eventually sees Islam returning back into the Christian fold. This is why they're very happy to see the growth of Islam, because just like the growth of Eastern Orthodox Church, they can wait five hundred years, and absorb it back into the papal seat. This is how they see it. They see it as the prodigal sons that have just left home for a while, off doing their own thing, but they will come back to the family. That's how they see them. And Pope Francis the Jesuit sees the great technological reset, the world being invented by the secret unknowns of the psychopathic control grid as being a methodology or a means by which to hurry up and rush this return to the fold of the prodigal sons of Islam and Eastern Orthodoxy. With inside a kind of a new age Catholicism, which is exactly what Klaus Schwab is promoting. The way they look at cities, they're almost like monastic institution. You won't just have one Vatican city, you'll have techno Vatican scattered all over the world. That will function very much in the way that Jesuits oversee the control and running of the papacy. The secret unknowns. This is why I spend a lot of my time looking at 
mainstream stuff and things like the Vatican website and reading press releases, there are sweeping changes happening within Catholicism whereby it's not even Catholic anymore. And this is why I push the idea of folk Catholicism. If you're a Christian, I think the best thing for you would be become a, a, a folk Catholic. By that I mean you could still be inspired by the the gospel, synoptic gospels and the messages contained within there that are appealing to people, such as tolerance and love and compassion and so on, ch- charity and virtue. That's okay, that's fine. That's a, they're, they're all good, noble ideas. They're found in paganism, by the way. But if that's what your your gig is, that's what your jam is, good for you. With folk Catholicism, you will, you will abide by the feast days. You will go to the week in Croke Patrick on week Sunday. You can go to the Holy Wells. I mean, I'm a pagan, and I love going to places like St. Wilfred's Holy Well in Holywell in uh, Flintshire in Wales. I, 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 I'm as happy as a pig and shy in a place like that. A very Christian place, albeit maybe one has... St. Winifred may have been a pagan saint, a pagan icon, we don't know, but I, I'm very happy at these and many Christian wells. And, I mean, I like, there's even some Christian old Catholic and Protestant churches, I love going into them. I'm not, I'm not bigger than that sense where I, I, I shun them. But I won't go, you know, if I, was a, if I was to go back to Christianity and become a folk Catholic, I wouldn't abide by what the Pope says, I wouldn't go to... I wouldn't go. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go even go to mass. I mean, I, I, I you know, I'd go and pray in, in in nature or something. I've got places like Saint Winifred's Ho- Holy Well. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be you know following edicts of the Pope or anything like that. I think that's. I think many Catholics in the West are, by, and also in South America and other countries, are folk Catholics by nature, and these are the ones who will. Who are being rejected and being thrown out of the papacy by the changes that are taking place within it, simply because they have a richer or have an authentic spiritual nature to them that's never been never been welcomed by the the you know the the plutocrats the spiritual plutocrats of the Holy See. So I'm going to be watching the the, the Holy See. And I mean, I don't even call the Pope the Holy Father. As a you know, as a Pope Francis, I would never call him the Holy Father. I would have called Pope John Paul II and Pope John Paul I the Holy Fathers, out of respect for them as people. But certainly not this guy. This guy is this guy is the the General Secretary of the Catholic Communist Party. Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be university graduates. They'll start thinking there's 10,000 genders and no chromosomes, too. I tend to be fairly liberal in what you might talk about. Sexual politics or reproductive rights and so on. I'm certainly not from the Abrahamic end where there must be some kind of cultural war upon the genitalia of adults. Or in the case of certain factions we're in, Abrahamism, the attacking of the genitals of children. That would that be against things like circumcision. But in terms of the psychological neuroses inherent within the Abrahamic traditions regarding the reproductive rights of consenting adults, it's something I would be totally against. That I think that like consenting adults have every right to do what they want with their own bodies in the privacy of their own homes. Once no one is being abused and everyone is is agreeing, it's nobody's business but their own, especially not the business of the state or some cleric down the road. Having said that, when that crosses over into the world of abortion and things like that, it's not such a black and white issue. Now, I'm not anti-abortion. I'm pro-abortion in terms of if it's needed. If the woman feels that there's a genuine need for it and really, you know, has not 
become pregnant by stupidity or something like that or something has gone wrong with the baby she has cancer i don't think it should of course it shouldn't be used as a form of contraception which sadly it is these days but they just legalized abortion in argentina and you can actually see the same ngos that were behind the legalization of abortion in ireland using the same template the same playbook basically placing large numbers of women with psychiatric issues and uh, personality disorders in a public square in the case of dublin it was dublin castle and as soon as it's announced that it's legalized they go screaming like they just won the world cup yay we can kill our kids yay we can legally border kids yay. like i said i'm not against the idea in some in many cases it can be justified and should be used to avoid you know future horrors of an unnecessary birth for lots of reasons but it certainly isn't something to have a party about it's a very private internal solemn matter a serious thing that requires focus and contemplation and not be given over to screaming demented harpies who sound like foghorns it's always the same they were not always the same types it's always, always some personality disorder with who gets some liberal agenda passed and the camera always focuses on them and they go mm-hmm. that's that, that they open their mouth mm-hmm. the parliament has just legalized abortion mm-hmm. Government today decreed that there are 47,392 genders. It is now legal for 50-year-old men to marry 9-year-old boys. As part of diversity and tolerance in the community, secular democracy and civil rights have been replaced with Sharia law. That's what they're like, foghorns. And the camera always focuses in on them. And you see them in Argentina, you see them in Ireland, you see them in anywhere. I saw them when, the last time I saw them in England was during the, when they had that big Trump balloon. They had a, that stupid, all these all these pathetic middle class people going, oh look, we've really taken down Trump. Oh, talk, when talk, when, we've taken down Trump. We've taken down Trump because of a big balloon. Yes, yes, we are fighting fascism with a big balloon. Oh. Keep staring at face masks. Live in fear. Keep your eye on the face mask. The face mask is the totemistic symbol of distraction. Do not pay attention to anything else going on in government, society, mainstream media, or the legal system while the face mask is present. Watch the face mask. Don't take your eyes off the face mask. Watch 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 the face mask. As you uh, as you're well aware, I'm a great believer in the concept of a parallel reality is developing, and although we are repulsed by some some of the things we see in the mainstream or sane people are and the everlasting gobstopper of gaslighting that's presented by the uh, willy whack jobs of globalism in order to demolish the psychiatric state of people as a whole and to the point where they don't know what's real and what isn't and then they can present them with a new reality of the system and methodology currently being used by mainstream media and big tech giants is identical to what happened when Mao Zedong in Tiananmen Square in 1950 declared the creation of the Chinese Communist Party as a national organization and state. He made it quite clear that the demolishing of traditional Chinese society 
moving towards industry, which was the technology of its time, atheism, and a classless society with no ownership of property where you own nothing was to be implemented. In reality, what they got was a power elite surrounding the inner circle of the Chinese Communist Party who collected things like American sports cars while the population in their communistic utopia were surviving on a bowl of rice a day. You see, this is the thing with the the whole concept of the utopia. The utopia is for the elites who create it. What happens to the society below this utopian, psychopathic, techno-psycho-manifest is irrelevant. Once the elite are in utopia, once they have the Epicurean you know, reality around them. See, when they say, when they say utopia, what they really mean is an Epicurean existence that they never have to worry about being taken from them for the elite inner circle. Now, we all know what happened with China. There was a complete and total economic catastrophe, as Marxism always is. And when Mao Zedong died, you had the Gang of Four had their power struggle in the 1970s. And then China said that they were temporarily going to open up their economy to Western methods of business in order to establish a foundation of economic security for the state and to improve technology. Now, a lot of this was done through espionage. They would do things like buy something from another country, everything from a typewriter to a coffee machine to a, a, you know, an electric locomotive or a, a metro train or a four-wheel drive vehicle. And then they would reverse engineer it, basically strip it down to its every little tiny nut and bolt. They would even unpick the thread, the threading out of the upholstery on the seats of cars that they were re-engineering and count the length and thickness of the tread used to stitch the upholstery to the car seat. They would study and analyze the chemical composition of adhesives and glues used to do things like glue on dashboards or glue labels on tape recorders and this kind of thing until they had gotten to the very essence of at a component level of everything that was the the object that they were re-engineering was made from. And the reason why they had this re-engineering psychosis and ability to do this is because they'd already done the same with people. They had re-engineered people. That what they, they did is they studied them to the finite level. And we've had that here in the West. We've had things like psychiatry and psychology. We've had things like Mousetopia and the Milgram experiment, and so on. And this is given from the time of Sigmund Freud on to the present, the schematic of the human condition in terms of how it functions in Western society, down to every little piece. And then they re-engineered it back into something that was a copy of what was there before, but functioned or looked different. So, for instance, if the Chinese got a metro train from Germany somehow, they would they would do something like, we'd like to buy, order some, some trains like you have in the Berlin metro. Could we have one to test it on Chinese railways? The, the train would be sent over. It would be shipped to a secret factory one somewhere. And they, well, it was supposed to be tested on the tracks of, of a, you know, a metro system. And then they would begin the secretive re-engineering, taking it down to literally everything, right down to fragments of paint. And then they would send it back to the, the Germans and say, oh, it wasn't really what we needed. Very nice train and a, a Chinese version that looked very similar to the German one that when they had ripped off all the engineering and all the design features and the electric system with Chinese names on the control panel and painted in different colors, windows slightly different shaped and uh, cosmetically on the surface looking very different than the one they got from Germany. 
but internally in a mechanical and functional electrical way, identical, totally ripped off because the communist robot mind cannot create because it is at war with natural law. And creativity is a byproduct of natural law. When you remove natural law, you do not have the ability to create. You become a facsimile of a human being that's only capable of replication and copying. And that's why they couldn't invent new kinds of trains in China. You see, China has this fantastic uh, high-speed rail system. None of it is Chinese. It's all German. They just copy. And, uh, or, you know, or they copy the French system, the TGV system, and so on like that. It's, it's not theirs. The only thing that they're good at is the f- building it really fast. And that's because, basically, the workers have no choice and no rights. Now, so you can... In the West, they, they looked at this and said, well, it, you know, if the West had looked at China and went, shit, they've become the leaders of the world by ripping off everything we've done and then use cheap labor to become a superpower. That would have been the normal reaction. It's, and that's the reaction of sane, intelligent people like Donald Trump. But to politicians, to big tech people and CEOs, they looked at that and went, you know, they have the right idea. The problem all along wasn't that we're good at making technology and not protecting our technology. The problem all along was our citizens are not terrified slaves like the Chinese are under the Chinese Communist Party. And that was the factor. That's what, that's what made them, instead of, instead of going to war against China for stealing patents and and technology they decided that the, the they were in because they're psychopaths they were in huge admiration of the chinese ability to gaslight their population into believing that having no rights and being re-educated and re-engineered see re-education and re-engineering the same thing was a was was just fantastic so since about since about 2001 but a little later they have been doing this they've been re-engineering the humans in the west in the same way the Chinese would re-engineer a piece of technology from the East. They opened us up like we were a tape recorder or a food processor or a, a four-wheel drive vehicle. And they examined every component within our psyche. which And using everything going right back to Bernays and all through all the other things I just spoke about. And then began to re-engineer us. And how they re-engineer us is they change us. They can change us at the internal level. Only nature, or if you believe in a god force, the super being of the universe created us. They can't change that internal spirit, mainly because they don't have it themselves and don't understand that we have this human spirit inside us. But what they can do is like the Chinese metro chain, they can change the facade. And how you do things like that is you say, you know that thing you said about chromosomes? About there was X and Y chromosomes, male and female. Well, it's not really true. Well, it is true, but it's a spectrum. There are actually thousands of genders. And suddenly, the fundamental thing of the duality of a human being, male, female, left, right, up, down, black, white, zero, one, the fundamental element of a separation from the whole in terms of I'm a man, he's a man, she's a woman, she's a woman, he's a man. This creates a sense of self-reference. And that's a fundamental part of your individuality. When a man and a woman are together, she knows she's a woman, he knows she's a man. Therefore, from this dynamic of duality of the two of them being together, the the sense of the self is further entrenched in the individual. I am the man, This I am with this woman. I am the woman, I am with this man. I am an individual. I am a self-autonomous person. And I know that because the person across from me is a different gender, a different person, a different psyche, and a different soul. The immediate thing to destroy that is to say, there's no such thing as gender. So therefore, you're reduced to a thing. I am a thing. She is no longer a woman. She is a thing. I am her. She is me. There is no separation. Therefore, my brain is the same as thing's brain. 
thing's brain is the same as my brain. All these things around us have the same brains as thing's brain in this house. We are the thing. So you see, the, the demolishing of genders has far more to do with the destruction of psychological autonomy than it has anything to do with the destruction of, you know, family traditions and values. But that's also part of it, because that comes from... You see, that's the irony of these things. By recognising genders, social roles, family structures, class systems, and even things like race, is it entrenches the sense of individuality into a person, because by creating a sense of separation, or when I say separation, I don't mean like in a kind of a sectarian you know, exclusive sense. A sense of difference would be a better way of putting it. By creating a personal sense of difference from you, of you from others, it, 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 it further reinforces and adds foundation to your personal psyche because you know you're different. You're immediately different at a fundamental level according to gender. And from that, all the other differences that make up your unique and beautiful personality are spawned out from that. If you go down to the base function of there is no gender, there is no family, men and women can both become pregnant, men and women can both become fathers and mothers, a man can be a woman, a woman can be a man, a mix can be of everything. Desmond is amazing. Next thing you know is there's no sense of separation. It's all the blob, the thing. And that's that's why they make such a big thing about the whole gender fluid thing. Because gender fluidity is personality destroying. Of course, they sell it under the thing of a classic Orwellian gaslighting. It's the whole, you know, ignorance of strength, freedom of slavery thing. The, the, whole, the whole thing is sold as, hey, I'm individual. I'm different. I'm, I'm just being me. But every other little... Every little other Desmond is amazing in the class will be just like him. A good example is what 15-year-old girls look like. They look like... Most 15-year-old girls now look like they're they're 35-year-olds on the game. And that has everything to do with Instagram filters. The the Instagram filter or the Snapchat filter creates a, a standard model female of a certain age group. They all look the same. They all look the same. To the point now where they don't know even who they are in real life. They, they see themselves in the mirror and they don't know it's them. Because they identify, identify more with the thing that's on Instagram. And you look at what a 15-year-old girl today looks like compared to a 15-year-old girl 20 years ago looked like. And it's, 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 it's inconceivable. They look like grown women. But what they really look like is not grown women. What they really look like are sex dolls. And this is what this is really about. If you look at what a, the sex dolls that are sold by companies or marketed, they look identical to these filters that, that what they do to women and things like Instagram and Snapchat. That's to, the, to create the, the thing that a woman and a machine are the same thing. The thing, the thing, not the individual, not the person, not the psyche, not the soul, the thing. So we're, what big tech is doing and mainstream media and college professors are doing, is they're copying the methodologies of the Chinese Communist Party right back to the 1950s with the destruction of the self. Now, if there's one thing that communism leads to more than anything else, if you were to say communism has one fundamental cul-de-sac that it ends up in, right, before it collapses, But there's one fundamental cul-de-sac that communism leads to, and that's cannibalism. Cannibalism is completely normal in China at this point. I wouldn't say normal, but it's not uncommon. People basically eat their dead family members, particularly dead aborted babies that are born that they can't take care of under these barbaric... Now, I'm not blaming the Chinese people. This is directly... The co- the, been created by the Chinese Communist Party, whom the likes of Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, and all these other technocratic utopi- utopian psychotics are completely in love with. This is this is they look at that and they it's beautiful to them. This is what they this is what the the, the thought of a Chinese baby being pulled out of a, a drain that had been flushed down 
and then someone picking her up and going, we can have this for dinner. It enchants, enchants and brings joy to the heart of the likes of Bill Gates. You remember that. That's what you're dealing with. That's what goes on in these awful, gigantic, high-rise buildings, housing systems in China. That's what goes on there. And there's plenty of Chinese who have blown the whistle on this. It's not propaganda from the West. These are Chinese distants who have escaped and said, you will not believe what the communists have done to China. But it wasn't just China. When the, when the Bolsheviks took over Russia and did things like got the Kulaks, who are the farmers who had land, Kulaks were seen as the most dangerous element to the Bolsheviks because they were farmers who had their own land and could produce their own food. Therefore, they weren't dependent upon the state. So what they did was, just like, say, the American survivalists in America, you know, the survivalists in the USA, what they did with the Kulaks was to portray them as being selfish lunatics who were enemies of the state. And they did remarkable things, like put them on trains, saying they were being resettled somewhere in Siberia, go into the middle of nowhere and say, get off the train. Where they wouldn't know where they were, in the middle of it, in the middle of you know Central Asia, maybe a hundred miles from the nearest village, in the middle of a wolf-ravaged uh, region, and just left there. And how did they survive? They ate each other. They ate the ones that died. There was numerous cases of it. Cannibalism was common in the gulags, and uh, this is what communism does. It it it, it moves slowly. So I'm not, when I say about the when I talk about the cannibalism in China, I'm not talking about the the Chinese people being so horrible that they're they're like this. No, this is this is the communist communism creates this, and communism in Ireland, Britain, Germany, France, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa would produce the same event results eventually, because. What happens is, at the initial stage, the, the, the demolition of the psyche, the belief that no one is different from anyone else, removes the soul. Because your fundamental self of... This is why, I, this is why New Agers make me want to puke when they go, kill the ego. Kill the ego. Hey, man, kill the ego. You got to kill the ego, man. You know, you know you, Jesus Christ, it's the ego that keeps you safe. When they say, when a new ager goes, you must transcend, man. You know, kill the ego. My name is, uh, you know, Meadow Sweet Star Child. And I'm, a, you know, a fifth generation Navajo shaman. My name is, I was born in, in you know, south of Guadalupe in a small village. My name is uh, Tecnocotal uh, Exocotoral real name Herschel Weinstein and I live in you know I, I'm, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a fifth generation you know a Mayan shaman and uh, you know you got to kill kill the ego man you got to kill 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 like just kill that ego you know you know oh wait hold on a second yeah, yes pop yeah yeah okay yeah yeah close the deal on that you know that that apartment in Great Neck we you should get at least two million for that now as I was saying you got you got to kill the ego and you know that's so that's that's what that's all about the destruction of the self and when you de destroy the self, when you destroy the self, you uh, you're gone, and you will be you will decay into anything. You will decay into anything. It's just what will happen, you know. It's just it's just it's just what will happen, and uh, and it, it, you know it's not that the Chinese they're humans just like the rest of us. They're they're people just like we are. It's the system, the over the oversoul of of the communist system that destroys these people. So separation from the other is so important for the integration of the self. And that's why they despise anyone who can think for themselves. Twitter just banned Jim Corr, who was doing great, great work demolishing the scandemic. Uh, he would have been reported by Irish civil servants and people who are being paid, you know, full pay sitting at home playing video games all day and watching Netflix. You know, they have a vested interest in keeping the scandemic going. 
and they were, you know, they said he, they, they silenced him for selfish reasons. It's just like I said with the guy who says, you're not going to kill my, my elderly mother by, by, by stopping the lockdown. The reason why he, you know, why he doesn't want his elderly mother dead is because he's a 60-year-old loser who never left home and his mother's making dinner for him. And he can't make his own tea. And that's why he doesn't want, th- that's, that's, that's why he, he's not worried about his mother for his mother's sake. He's worried about losing in the neighbour. And that's why these same people report to Jim Corr. They, they're worried about losing their enabler, which is the Irish taxpayer, which pays all this money to keep them at home. And you would have things like the journalists who have their jobs secure and so on, because governments are now pouring money into media. We're now, we're now The TV license in Ireland now is going to pay the fund newspapers and bloggers who pr- promote government propaganda. See, the Chinese Communist Party has basically taken over the EU and the West as a whole. I mean, the last stand is Trump, and that's why he's portrayed as the devil. He is sort of like the Uber Kulak. You know, the Uber Kulak is Trump. He wants us all to maintain our individual individuality and our sense of self and disconnection from others in order to integrate the self as a person and therefore be a creative force in the world that safeguards your own personal destiny and the ones closest to you. I am me, you are you, we are separate, our egos are important. That's why I've also pissed off all, a lot of New Agers lately when I pointed out a Ricky, Rick Recky. Uh, I'm sorry, folks, it's the truth. I didn't make this up. This is why so many New Age ratbags end up just becoming the most horrible people in the world. They're possessed. They're like, uh, you know, dibble boxes made up of middle-aged New Age women. Uh, Recky is Asian demonology. End of. I didn't make that up. I didn't invent that. The so-called... I'm working with spirits, man. I'm working with spirits. Okay? Be more specific about the nature of these spirits. They're they're beings of light, man. They're angels. And you've seen them. No, but I know they're there, man. Oh, yeah. Six months later, he's in a psychiatric hospital going... Yeah, get them all! Get them all! Ah. That's what happens with recce practitioners. Recce masters. Who's really mastering them? <laughs> Demons. Now, there are people who, I'm not saying people who go into recce are evil or anything like that. I say that a lot of them who go into it, well, I'd say about half of them are just scammers who are just trying to uh, live off people. The other half would be decent people who want to help others and maybe have a natural healing inclination. But because we live in a world where everything is sold as a price, they go, I can help people by a, rec- a recce master. Maybe you already have this natural healing ability in you. Why do you need to have, you know, Japanese demons swirling around inside your skull while you're doing it, feeding off the pain and suffering of others? That's what's going on there. Well, I didn't make this up. I didn't invent that. The term reki even, you know, translates roughly in Japanese as, uh, you know, assisted by demons. This is what the belief was, that maladies were caused by, say you had pains or suffering that you couldn't find the reason for. That it was a belief that a demon might be living in your kidney or living in your spine. And therefore, how the recce, the, the real recce people that Japan would do was that they would invoke a demon, a greater demon. This is, this is, and then the greater demon would frighten the lesser demon out of the body of the individual and cure them. You have the same tradition with the cunning folk here. They would, they would, they would summon Oberon. The king of the fairies, the king of the, the sultan of the sultan fairy, really a demon. And Oberon's power would frighten the lesser demon out of the body of the uh, the sick person. That's what Recky is. I didn't make this up. It's not my fault that they didn't tell you this in that you know that that two thousand euro or three thousand dollar course you took in Sedona. That's not my fault. It's a fact. It's just what it is. Anyway. Uh, so this this parallel reality thing, right? This part, this nature, this power, this shifting parallel reality thing. Remember, a few years ago, I said that we would increasingly see species of animals in the, where they wouldn't be, and also fully formed complex mammals. And we're not talking about a, a microbe here. We're talking about something the size of a deer appearing all over the world in human habitated areas that were never noticed before. And just like I said, it's happening at a phenomenal rate. We're not talking about like, you know, a a species of bee 
in the arse end of the, am- the arse end of the Amazon. That sounds like a, a song from a, a mu- I'm a bee in the arse end of the Amazon. Yes, buzzing along, trying to find some ayahuasca. Yeah. Oh look, here comes a new wager. I could stake him on the ass. Yeah, I could, but he's too busy tripping and talking to reptilians and believing every word they say. Whoa, I'm a bee in the bar sand of the Amazon, on the ass of a new wager. Yeah. Anyway, a bee in the in the in the arse end of the Amazon, and uh, this bee in the arse end of the Amazon. No, it's not like that. We're talking about like big fucking primates and uh, deer and haired animals and all kinds of other things that appear where loads of people live and they go well fuck me I didn't see that what's that there and they go it's a it's it looks like a deer what kind of deer I don't know I've never seen one like that before and then the next thing you know where these humans live there's a whole herd of these deer they're having like a black and white stripes on their bum, and uh, they've never noticed it before. And it's a a reason they call it to use the David Attenborough term uh, a recently discovered species. Yes, uh, recently. The noob line. I here I am in the deepest Congo, and. Uh, I'm just flown in on a jet helicopter from my luxury resort hotel, and I'm s- sitting here in the jungle, pretending I'm, pretending I'm, you know, a, a, a Victorian explorer, and uh, we'll edit this shot to make it look like I have a, a Doctor Doolittle type gift to attract animals, you know. But anyway, after we paid the coolies to go find these animals. 400 of the coolies came back and three of them found this this new this newly discovered species and uh, the new lion and, and 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 of course it's it's all darwinism darwinism is all about the strong and the mighty eating the uh, eating the weak and the sick and uh, I love to show big cats dangerous animals Hunting and killing, killing innocent small animals and weak animals. The noble lion, because because it reminds me of of the of, of the, the the world I grew up in, where I, I my aristocratic background. I was handed the BBC as a graduation gift from Cambridge. Yes, I was. They gave me BBC too, and uh, uh, this is because. Uh, the, the strong and the aristocratic are the same as the, the noble lion and, and, and all the other big cats who prey on the weaklings. And this is to tell you that you're a weakling and, and the royal family and aristocrats like me, the noble lion, are, 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 the, are, are, are Darwin's special strong species you know that's that's what that's really about and uh although there are thousands and thousands of hours of bbc footage of s- smaller animals fighting back and even e- things like zebras killing lions and z- tigers and other kinds of creatures that we don't want you to see because it, it would make darwinism look bad they're available on YouTube. In fact, there's hundreds of them, but don't watch them because they're obviously been made by conspiracy theorists. So anyway, anyway, so we're in the jungle, right? And, you know, yeah. Oh, oh, that caviar I had for breakfast is... is, is oh, oh. They really, really got to work on getting proper breakfast in African hotels. I mean, I mean... I, I, couldn't get for the life of me a swan's egg omelette in Kampala. Anyway, here we are. You know. In, oh, oh go, go, you know. Oh, truffles in Ghana. Forget about it. Anyway. Uh, and so this newly discovered species. It, although there's a breeding population of about 10,000 and no one's noticed it before, it was always there. We just, we just didn't see it. We just didn't see it. 
It's as simple as that. So, it was undiscovered. Now, uh, personally, I don't believe this because I think there's something more going on. You, you cannot have fully sustainable breeding populations of complex mammals and other animals that no one's noticed before suddenly come out of the blue in areas where human habitation exists. And this is literally what's happening. Could it be that like the Mandela effect, we're getting as this deteriorating matrix unfolds, demolishes, fluctuates, dissolves, that we're having overlapping elements of different realities pouring into this one or even falling out of this one you know i really do i really do believe that i mean there's people just disappear sometimes and new people come into your life amazingly that are like you, you feel like you've known them forever and i i really do believe that if we keep concentrating on this concept that like you know let let the let the globalists do what they want let the <clears throat> technocratic utopian psychotics do what they want if we focus on a different reality for ourselves we'll pull away from it and it's happening and it's ha this is you know even if that's all bollocks and that's nothing to do with that and it really is it you know discovered speed no lion you know even if that's you know can be that can be rationally explained away you could see it in things like i mean literally now when in and this is from only a week even later from the Christmas show. I'm looking at the comment sections of Irish newspapers and Irish Twitter and stuff like that. And it's everything is like, end this lockdown, you're full of shit. These tests are bogus. Uh, it's all about control. It's, it's, it's out of control. Now you're trying to wreck our culture, our small businesses, our mental health. These are the normal comments. These are the main, the main comments now. And before, like... Three months ago, it would have been completely the other way around. It'd be nothing by people screaming for, like, the government can, only the government can save me, save me. And if anyone said, this just makes no sense, you're wearing a tinfoil hat, you're wearing a tinfoil hat, these types, you're right wing that they've all vanished, all them. The Empire of False Pestilence has fallen everywhere except within the Imperial Palace. Mm, that's what's happened. The Empire of False Pestilence has fallen except within the imperial palace and where it is right now it's where the romanovs were and i'm not saying the romanovs deserved what they got but the romanovs didn't pay enough attention to rasputin and ras people like that and the mystics there was lots of mystics and shamans remember you know the the nicholas and alexandria were, were were very kind of like new agey people for their time they were big into all that spiritualism and this kind of thing this is how what's his name Rasputin got on the door there. But they were surrounded by people saying, there are dark forces coming against you. You must act on them. There are dark forces. And they were being told these things, but they didn't act on them. They didn't act on them. And that's what happened in Russia. That's what happened. This is the, you know, that's what's, that's what's happened. And it fell. So in, everywhere except the Imperial Palace, Russia had collapsed, except inside the Winter Palace of the Romanovs. And eventually reality hit them with a bang in the face. You know, for the wrong reasons, of course. But still, they, they were they could not get into their head. And it was the same with the Bourbons and the French. They could not get it. That the world outside had changed. And it's the same thing now with the Empire of False Pestons. It's literally only the ones connected to the, arist the aristocrats of COVID-19, of Covanity. COVID it's literally only them. And their tow rags, you know, their servants, their 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 band servants, their civil servants, and the only ones who still believe it. It has fallen. It has fallen. And they're 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 frantically getting winter flu flu cases, and trying to make out they're all COVID cases. But this is because the the, the take up on the vaccine is terrible. It's easy enough to inject an old lady who doesn't even know what her name is. Hello, Mary. Do you want the the vaccine? Do I want the what? The vaccine? Sure, I would want the vaccine. Ah, oh, Mary, this is the vaccine needle. I have to put the needle in your arm. What? The needle in your arm will stop you from dying. You live for another week instead of dying in two weeks. You'll live. You'll be dead in three weeks. 
They would have made an arm, Mary. What's an arm? You know, and that that's that's that. It's easy to get a needle inside those poor people, those those old folks. You know, they'll be lining up for it. And then you have, you know, I fucking love science. You know, I rolled up my arm. I fucking, I fucking love science. And uh, I have a rational mind. I love, I fucking love Richard Dawkins. And, oh, Brian Cox is just poured into that. Poured into that pair of trousers he was wearing the other day. But I fucking love science. I fucking, I fucking, and, and I rolled my arm up and I took the vaccine because I fucking love science. I fucking love it. You know, those types. Now, did you see that thing of that woman? Did you see that thing of that woman that she was a nurse, I think it was in Alabama, and she got the COVID vaccine live on TV? And then she starts fainting, right? I've been talking about that, right? But anyway. There was a, a conspiracy theory going around that she died, which is pretty awful. I hope I, I hope she didn't die. And this guy made a video that was actually quite convincing. He produced the the death certificate with the same relatives and everything of the the same name as the nurse and the same age. And I was like, oh shit, that's that's pretty awful that she died. And then her parents came forward and said, oh no, she's fine, she's okay. Now I'm still suspicious. We're talking about a woman who couldn't wait to go on camera to promote herself and the vaccine. And then she fainted. If she is that, you know, in love with the camera and that eager to be in front of media, why is why have we not seen... I haven't seen any videos of her coming forward and saying, I'm okay. I can only surmise that, are we getting the full story here? Not to say that she's dead, but what if, her, what if she's had some kind of, like, palsy? From the and, you, and and the mouth one, one side of the mouth is up in the air and the other side of the mouth is down below. It's kind of, it, that's what happens. I've noticed. Have you ever seen that? Some of these people have vaccine reactions and their 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 mouths turn into a vagina. It literally starts moving, you know, vertically. The, the, instead of the mouth going up and down, or left to right, it goes up and down. You know, I, I think in the end, you know, that was a disaster for them. I mean, that was a catastrophe. It didn't matter. And, and, and the media say, oh, 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 she did. And the, and the media were saying things like, yes, she had a reaction to the vaccine, but that's a personal condition she has. And I really think that, you know, of course, there's, there's plenty of people out there who will buy that. Like, I fucking love science. I just fuck. I fucking love science. And uh, that nurse that collapsed when the vaccine, COVID vaccine was put into her, it was because she was sick. And I, and anyone who would have, and if, that, if that puts anyone off, they don't fucking love science, you know? They, they don't love Brian Cox, those absolutely gorgeous Brian Cox poured into those fucking trousers. Whoa, whoa. You know, uh, them types, right? You know, them types. And then, the, you know, Mary in the, in the, in the, in the old people's home. She, she died. Oh, she fell down when she got injected. Maybe I shouldn't get injected. And the nurse comes over and goes, I already injected you, Mary. Oh, all right, sir. Oh, okay. What's a nurse? You know, it's easy enough to get them. Get them. But, you know, even the moron cheese heads, you know, at some level, a cheese, he a cheese brain still has a couple of active neurological brain cells from when they had a brain or... A prime, a primal brain, and they'd be going. She, she fainted, though, didn't she? You know that was almost like. And I hope that that lady. Now I'm not making. I'm not making fun of her fainting and getting sick. I hope she is okay. But if ever the gods stepped in, and gave us a sign that the empire of false pestilences is is, is not in tandem with natural law, I mean, what a PR catastrophe for the vaccine promoters. That a nurse going on TV saying, I have hope at last. This vaccine gives us hope. And then she falls down very ill after taking it. That was um, that was the gods intervening. I'm sorry. That's what that was. That was the gods intervening. That's what that was. And and, and the cheese, there'll be still semi, there'll be plenty of semi sentinel cheese brains 
and she's heads who will go, yeah, but she's still. <laughs> well, they say the vaccine's safe, right? They say the sick, the vaccine's safe, right? But, and does she had an underlying condition? Why might have the underlying condition? And maybe, oh, 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 come on now! Don't you fucking laugh, science? Don't you? Roll up your fucking arm, you peasant. But I don't know. I'm not. I I, I wanted the vaccine last week, but I I don't want it this week. Oh, you fucking tinfoil conspiracy fucking fool! But you had the vaccine, didn't you? I did because I fucking laughed. Eyes. All I could think of was the bulging Brian Cox's pants as, as the needle entered me. Oh, I fuck! Ooh, that ooh, they, they just poured that vaccine into me in the same way his ball just poured into his pants. I fucking laughed. Eyes. But you now have a mouth shaped like a vagina. You know, and. Uh, this is this is what it's like. This is literally, it's real time gaslighting itself. But that's it. It, it that was it, that was like this. That was like a gift from the gods. And again, like I hope that nurse in Alabama's okay and safe. You know, she's a young lady. She doesn't deserve to be sick. But her collapsing in front of the world's cameras was a, a catastrophe for Pfizer and the you know the the the, the branch covidians. Because even like I said, the semi sounded cheese heads will go. Oh, I'm not so. I'm not so keen on that vaccine now. No, no, jeez. That's way. They, they, you know that's what that. Look, like I said, I'm not an anti vaxxer If that vaccine is proven safe, I, I, I'll, I would take it if I had to. I was forced to. I'm not an anti vaxxer Okay, but I'm not. I'm not going to be a lab rat. I'm not going to be a human lab rat. Like that poor girl in, in Alabama was. I'm not. I'm not. You're not going to be a lab rat. I mean, no, nobody wants to risk having a a mouth like a vagina. No, nobody wants a mouth like a vagina. Especially a man. No man wants a mouth like a vagina. You only end up talking gash for the rest of your life. It's as simple as that. So the empire of false pestilence really has fallen. It really has fallen. It's just that the 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 Romanov Covidians in the Winter Palace hasn't figured it out yet. So anyway, that's uh, another year of me and another year of you. And we had a good laugh and lots of good times and creativity. And I can promise you 2021 is going to be even better. I have some a, a serious film in the works. That has been gratefully funded by the people on Patreon. And thank you for that. If you wish, I will ask that your name are, are included as production assistance in the film. Which will, it's a, still a secret, but the, the promo um, will be coming out in the spring. And uh, I think it's next level stuff for what my own work. And uh, just because I couldn't travel, they didn't beat me what I did. I brought in collaborators overseas and that's how you get around the restrictions. You don't sit at home with your arms folded, watching Netflix saying I want my fucking life back. You take back what, how much of life you can as you want it when it's available to you. And uh, 2021 will be a great year. Don't worry about it. You know, it's uh, cycles and stages and our ancestors have been through shit and we go through shit but we'll get out of this and we'll build a new reality going forward because you know what we've already won take care have a lovely new year's celebration wherever you are and uh fuck him if they can't take a joke hey don't you capish bill gates in his vaccine he's swimming with the fishes eh? Nubian! Satanic beta foil! Ooh!